needs to change their backbone. But we now know that that's not true, that energy fields, especially in the quantum mechanical range, those kinds of uh, energy fields are called constructive and destructive interference. Those energies can actually cause the backbone of the protein to change so that when these signals bind to a protein, it generates behavior. Behavior is the expression of life, okay? Now the question is, well, what controls the signals? Because in this case, the proteins exist, but the signals are the regulatory element. When a signal is present, the protein works. When a signal is not present, it may not work, or vice versa. So the question is, what controls the cell? And that's where we came in yesterday. We talked about the brain. I said it was the membrane. The membrane, the skin of the cell, that the genes do not control the cell simply by telling you this. I can remove the genes from the cell and the cell still has its life, still with the same behaviors and ability to respond to the environment. So the genes in their absence suggest that they can't be the ones that's controlling life. We come to the understanding that the skin of the cell is actually the brain of the cell. And I mentioned yesterday that the human skin is also the derivative of the human brain. So our brains are also derived from the skin. The relevance about that is the skin is the interface between the environmental signals and the proteins that create life. So when the signal comes to the membrane, it hits the membrane. There's a switch at the membrane which will interpret the signal and then send a secondary signal to generate the behavior. So the switch has two parts. One part reads the primary environmental signal and the other part of the switch is what sends the second signal or second message in some cases, that's what it's called. So the issue is, let's take a look at this membrane because we're going to find something very interesting about this. And it works like this. The membrane is this structure. It's, called, it's a bilayer structure. It's actually two rows of molecules with a mirror image of each other. So I'll give an example. There in the middle is uh, the head of a molecule, and this is called a phospholipid. The head is polar, meaning it has positive and negative charges. But the legs of the molecule are nonpolar. They're oil. And so the difference is, it's like oil and water. The heads absorb and bind to water, but the legs are oil, and they resist water. As a result, the membrane makes a fine barrier, because whatever is in the outside environment, generally dissolved in water, is generally not able to pass through the membrane because of the oil phase in the center, and that's why the membrane's a barrier. So when I want to show you an electron microscope picture, it's almost an exact image of this. Here's a picture of the human cell membrane. And what you can see is the middle, there's a dark, light, dark layering. And if I go back one slide, you can see there's dark, light, and dark. And so the, the model and the image are pretty much the same of each, as each other. Now, as I said, the middle part is oil loving. So if I actually cut out a piece of this, of this membrane right here, it'd be like a bread and butter sandwich, where the heads of the molecules that love water are like bread because bread soaks up water. And then the middle of the sandwich, butter, would be the equivalent of the inside. So if, here's an example of what the cell membrane looks like. <laughs> and the relevance about that is that this is the lipid leg region, and this is the phosphate head region. And why is this important? Because imagine we're in a cell right now, and that over our head is a membrane, a big bread and butter sandwich, and I'm sitting here saying, well, let's say we're thirsty, and we want the universe to give us something to drink. So I ask the universe, would you give us something to drink? And so the universe dollops on some grape juice. And the issue is, okay, there's been a big dollop of grape juice thrown on the, on the ceiling here, which is this bread and butter sandwich. Will we or will we not be able to drink any of that grape juice, yes or no? No, no. and the reason? The lipid won't let, the wa won't let it get through. Well, I can show you if I section the sandwich, let's section it, and you can see, yes, as soon as the grape juice hits the lipid layer, Boom, it's a barrier, it can't go across. Well, that suggests then something very interesting about the cell is then, then how does the cell get food inside and how does it get waste out? How does it communicate? And the answer is because the membrane has more than just the phospholipids, the membrane also has proteins. Remember I, those that were here yesterday, I showed a poppet bead necklace and I said that the poppet beads were amino acids and the backbone of the protein. Well, some of the amino acids are oil-loving amino acids. So when you have a region of oil-loving amino acids, they prefer to be stuck in the butter part of the sandwich, and the hydrophilic or water-loving uh, parts of the protein extend above and below the membrane. So these proteins are anchored into the membrane. They're called integral membrane proteins, IMP. The integral membrane protein. Sometimes there are multiple regions, oh, excuse me, the parts, of, the parts that extend out of the surface have antennas on them. Generally, they're sugar antennas. 
And these antennas are a part of the tuning mechanism of the protein, like tuning forks. So that these proteins are like tuning forks that resonate with environmental signals. So when an appropriate signal comes up that complements a tuning fork, it causes the tuning fork to respond and causes the protein to change shape, and that's the signal binding to the protein. Uh, as I said, sometimes there are multiple regions where there are lots of lipid uh, accumulations in the protein chain, so the same chain can weave in and out of the membrane. So in a sense, uh, if we looked at a membrane like this, it, the proteins would look like olives stuck in our bread and butter sandwich. So there they are right there, the proteins in the membrane. And the relevance about this now is, okay, now I go back and I say, okay, we have a bread and butter and olive sandwich for the ceiling. And then I ask the universe, would you please give us that grape juice I asked for? Now the question is this, will I or will I not, with an olive sandwich, be able to drink the grape juice, yes or no? Yes. And how did the grape juice come through? The through the olives? Yeah, but the pimento is in the olive, right? The pimento wants like the protein. Yeah, but the pimento is blocking the channel, right? Let's take a look at it. Oh, you see, when the pimento is in, then nothing can get through the olive. But when the pimento is out, the olive creates a channel. And as a result, I can let things in. Well, the difference is, what does it mean when a pimento is in or out of the olive? And the answer is, if you were here yesterday, I wish you were all were. The point is, proteins change shape. So I could have a protein that's tightly wrapped, and when a signal comes in, the backbone of the protein relaxes, and as it relaxes, it opens up. And when the signal's gone, it closes again. So I can open and close the gate. So far, so good, right? Okay, well, the next thing then we talk about is, well, what are these proteins that are built in the membrane? I said there are two classes, one with antennas, which are called receptors, and they're like your receptors, which are in your skin as well. Eyes, ears, nose, taste, touch, pain, pressure. They're receptors built into your membrane. The second class of proteins are effectors because I said the switch has two functions, one to receive the primary environmental signal, and the second is to send a signal into the cell to engage the protein machinery of the cell. So the switch has two parts, a receptor and an effector. So the issue about a primary signal picked up by the receptor, the secondary signal that goes into the cell and controls the protein gears that do life uh, is the concept of what the effector is actually doing. Okay, just to illustrate this in a dynamic form, I showed it yesterday, we'll do it one more time, and it shows like this, here's the uh, two components, the antenna uh, on the receptor, scanning the environment, looking for a signal, the connector between the receptor and the effector, and again, look at the shape of this, it doesn't combine or match the shape of this until the signal comes. When the signal comes, it changes the shape, causing this protein to couple to this protein, and when that happens, this protein, like the olive, opens up, and sends a signal into the cell that controls the nature of whatever functions uh, attached to that signal. When the primary signal is gone, the switch disconnects. Okay, now the relevance about all this is this represents an important switch. This is a switch that interacts between the environmental signal and the function of the cell. This is the elemental unit of awareness because these two proteins together require, are required for a cell to respond to an environmental stimulus. The first part, the receptor, which is uh, an awareness of the environment, is reading the primary signal. The second protein is sending a physical sensation into the cell. Together, they form a unit by definition, which is an awareness of the environment through physical sensation, which is called perception. That is a molecular unit that translates or transduces an environmental signal into behavior. So anything you're doing when you're responding to the environment, you must have perception units that are reading that environmental stimulus, whatever it is, and then adjusting your biology in response to that stimulus, okay? Now, back in 1985, when I was putting all this understanding of how the brain of the cell worked, the membrane, what really clued me in and drove me, like, wow, just changed my life was, I wrote the definition of the membrane down in the functional definitions I just described. And I sat there in 1985, and what did I write? Well, the first thing is I characterized, remember the lipids that were making up the uh, bread and butter sandwich? Uh, it's a bilayer, that it's a mirror image of each other. Note that the molecules are lined up like soldiers on parade. They're in a crystal form. When molecules have a regimented orientation, they're called crystals. But what's really important is there are no chemical bonds anchoring 
these next to each other, so all the molecules are just standing next to each other. They're not connected to each other. Imagine a lot of people in an elevator. Everybody's standing tight like this, and somebody in the back of the elevator wants to get out. So what do they do? They, they all move like this, and somebody gets out to the front. What was the point? All the units in the elevator were all in registration, but they were also movable that they weren't connected to each other and they moved by just shuttling around. Well, the point is,